we're thankful that we can be together again this evening as we continue on this journey towards the cross with Jesus. And as we, we come this evening, as you can see, it's Jesus' betrayal and arrest. And uh, like with the majority, if not 100% of messages, when you prepare, you're preparing for yourself. You're looking within and saying, well, Lord, what are you saying to me as I'm preparing this? Uh, and yeah, he spoke to me again today as going through this and, and getting, getting my thoughts onto paper about betrayal, denial, and that. So we'll see this evening what the Lord has to say to you as well. And so Heavenly Father, as we come this evening to once again continue on the journey with your son towards the cross. Oh, this evening we see a, we see a side that for many of us we don't want to talk about. We, we don't want to think about because maybe for us it's a sore point. Maybe we have been betrayed. Maybe somebody has denied, disowned us, or we have done it to somebody else. And so, Lord, as we, we come this, morning, this evening to hear your word, we just pray that our hearts will be opened, our, our ears will be opened to hear what you have to say to us this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm just going to read some selective verses from Mark 14, starting from verse 17 and ending at verse 72. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. This is at the upper room. While they were reclining at the table and eating, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They were saddened, and one by one they said to him, Surely not I. It is the one, it is one of the twelve, he replied. The one who dips his bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to the man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Rise, let us go. Here is the betrayer said Jesus to Peter, James, and John in the Garden of Gethsemane after Jesus had returned from praying. And just as he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appeared, and with him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs sent by the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Rabbi, and kissed him. The men seized Jesus and arrested him. And then one of those standing near drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Am I leading a rebellion, said Jesus, that you have to come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I was with you, teaching in the temple courts, and you did not arrest me. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. Then everyone deserted him and fled. They took Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests, elders, and teachers of the law came together. Peter followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. There he sat with the guards and warmed himself at the fire. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When he saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him. You also were with that Nazarene Jesus, she said. But he denied it. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't, I don't understand. You, you, you don't know what you're talking about. And he went out into the entrance. When the servant girl saw him there, she said again to those standing around, This fellow is one of them. Again he denied it. 
After a little while, those standing near to Peter said, Surely you are one of them, for, for you are a Galilean. Peter began to call down curses on himself, and he swore to them, I don't know this man you're talking about. Immediately, the cock crowed the second time. Then Peter remembered the words of, that Jesus had spoken to him. Before the cock crows twice, you will disown me three times. And he broke down and wept. I want you to finish this sentence. A loyal friend is? Some ideas. What is a loyal friend? Sorry? Priceless. A loyal friend is priceless. Anything else? Do we have any takers on priceless? Anything more? <laughs> hard to find. Yeah. A loyal friend is hard to find. A loyal friend is? Trustworthy? A loyal friend is kind? What about helpful? Loving? Giving? Supportive? A listener? A shoulder to cry on? But betrayal is one of the most painful things that we ever experience. And it comes so quickly and unexpectedly. That's, that's where the real pain lies, because of the speed which it, with which it comes to us. They were your friend. They were your confidant. You trusted them with confidential information. The greater the trust, the greater the pain. The deeper the love, the deeper the wound. Betrayal is never easy to come to terms with, especially when it comes from those we trust and love. And probably one of the best known stories, um, or the, not story, it's an account of Jesus in the Bible, is that of Judas and his betrayal of Jesus. Yes, we know that, that Jesus was destined to suffer and die. The Old Testament prophesied it over and over again. And there was an, even a prophecy that he was going to be betrayed. We can see it in Psalm 41 verse 9. And that Judas planned ahead of time to, to do this betrayal is evidence in the fact that he went to the priests. He went to the, the priests in the temple seeking 30 pieces of silver for the deed that he was going to commit. And I'm sure that Jesus himself was deeply pained when he told Judas that night in the upper room to leave, to go and do what you have to do. Go and do it quickly. And he handed him over to Satan. And it most likely pained Jesus all the more that Judas betrayed him with a kiss. A kiss of friendship. A kiss of recognition. A kiss of brotherhood. The backstabbing is probably easier to bear than betrayal. Because with, with backstabbing, you're being criticized by someone in a, in a treacherous manner, despite them pretending to be your friend. But with betrayal, on the other hand, you're being stabbed in the chest while being looked at in the eye by someone you trust, someone you know, someone maybe you even love. I think William Shakespeare captured the essence of betrayal when he, uh, in it, the, the feeling of betrayal in his play Julius Caesar. And in that famous scene where all the, the senators are, are around Julius Caesar and they're stabbing, each, the, each of them having their turn to stab their knife to Julius Caesar, the final and the most unkind cut came from his friend. And that famous line, et tu, Brute. You as well, Brutus? No, everybody else could do it, but you as well? Accomplice to it? And Brutus' words, then fall, Caesar. It's as though that was the sword cut that brought his death. 
those words. And in that the funeral oratory that Mark Anthony um, gives, Shakespeare calls it the, the most un unkindest cut of all. The one that Mark Anthony gave him. No, the one that uh, Brutus gave to Caesar. And I think Shakespeare grasped that additional pain of betrayal by a friend in those words. The most unkindest cut of all. Jesus Christ was sent into this world to die for the sins of mankind. And Paul noted that, that, that it is rare for one person to, to die to save another. We read that in Romans chapter 5, verse 7. And God's gift of, of his son was so precious that we do not have the words to describe it. Our vocabulary is just not big enough to describe what Jesus came to do for us. And we don't have the, the ability to fully grasp the, the, the gift in our minds that we have in Jesus. Jesus, his blood, cleanses us from all our past sins. And that, that the point of when we accept that gift of, our, of salvation, sins are forgiven and our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. How wonderful is that? That our sins are forgiven and our name is written in that book. And God requires that we don't betray him or do anything that would take away from his majesty. And Satan and his demons, they take note of that. They take note of it. And Satan tries with all his might to, to devour us to get us to betray Jesus in one way or another. And a strong, a strong example of God's trust is found in the book of Job. We, God knew from Job's pattern of obedience that he would be faithful, that Job would be faithful. You know, God proclaimed to Satan that in spite of, of Satan's attacks on Job, Job had not, uh, not betrayed God at all. Even... He proclaimed it even before the angels in heaven. Look at my servant Job. Righteous before everybody. And then in Matthew chapter 4, we see Satan himself trying to do everything he can to cause Jesus to stumble and betray his father. And in spite of the state that Jesus found himself in, the, the fact that he was hungry and that he was thirsty because he hadn't eaten for 40 days, Satan used all his, his, his fingers and tentacles and whatever he had to get Jesus to turn his back on his father and to worship him. And like the account of Job, just like the account of Job, we know that Jesus didn't fall for Satan's words and he didn't betray his father. But he remained strong and true to his father. We see in the Old Testament as well, time and time again, that, that Israel caused God great pain by betraying his trust. Time and time again, Israel would run after other gods. But time and time again, he accepted them back. See, Israel was the wife that God had chosen from his, from him, for himself. Out of all the nations of the world, he chose Israel for himself. And when we accept the blood of Jesus and have our names written in the Lamb's book of life, we become betrothed to God as well. We are his bride and he is our bridegroom. Judas Iscariot's betrayal of Jesus for 30 pieces of silver was probably one of the most darkest moments in all of history. And it made Judas the worst traitor of all time. Because he'd betrayed the Son of God. And on the night that when Jesus and his disciples were celebrating the Last Supper, Jesus, uh, Judas had plotted with the religious leaders to, to take them to Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. He knew Jesus was going there. So he, he organized, you guys come with me. I know where Jesus is going to be. You can get him then. 
See, Jesus wasn't just a pawn or a puppet in God's hands to fulfill the words and the prophecies of God. He betrayed Jesus because he was a thief. and He, he never really believed that Jesus was his Lord. Judas spent three years with Jesus. Spent three years with him. They ate together. They, they served together. They talked about life together. And Jesus taught. Jesus loved and Jesus cared for Judas on the deepest level. Yet Judas was looking out for himself and a few pieces of silver. And because of that, he goes down in history as a man of evil intents. But he isn't the only one who we see betraying Jesus. He's not the only one. Peter had, had said to Jesus earlier that evening, while they were there in the Garden of Gethsemane, that even if everybody else should fall away, I will not. I will continue to follow you. I will be with you through thick and thin. But Jesus knew and said to Peter that night, before the, ro ro the rooster crows twice, you will have disowned me three times. But that was just disowning Jesus. Peter didn't betray him. Or did he? Peter was in the courtyard that, that night. He had followed behind Jesus in the shadows and got into the, the courtyard of the high priest there. And he was warming himself by the fire with the other people that were around them. And then the servant girl looks at him, spots him, and points at him, saying that he was with that Nazarene. And Peter vehemently denied it. No way, that's, it wasn't me. That, maybe it's uh, somebody that looks like me, or has got the same robes as me or so. But no, 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 it was, it's not me. And then the same servant girl, a bit later, says that Peter was, was one of them, meaning one of the crowd, one of the disciples that followed Jesus around. And again, Peter denied it. And then standing around Peter, people pointed at him as being one of them because he too was a Galilean. And this time, Peter just called down curses on himself and he swore to them that he didn't know that man. Not the case of that he didn't know Jesus, but he didn't know that man. And then the rooster crowed that second time and Peter remembered what Jesus had said to him. And he went out and he wept bitterly. Peter's denial of knowing Jesus is just as bad as Judas's betrayal of Jesus. Judas betrayed Jesus and handed him over. Peter denied knowing Jesus. Both are sinful acts. Both of them are sinful acts. Both grieve to the heart of God. To betray or deny, in both instances, we push Christ away. Whether we betray him or deny him, we push him away, saying that, well, we don't need you. And how many times have we denied Christ? How many times have we denied Jesus when we've gone with the crowd? When we've joined in with the others so we don't look like a sore thumb. When we've laughed just to fit in. Or not turned away when we should have. But how many times have we betrayed Jesus when we've sold him out? Sold him out by thinking that, well, we can do better. We know better. Our judgment is better. Our instincts are better. Or that we are enough. We're no more fickle than those, those crowds who last Sunday were saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord and who this coming Friday are going to be shouting, crucify him. We're no more fickle than them. We're hurt when someone betrays us or when someone disowns us. But think what Jesus feels when we 
disown him, when we betray him. But still, he went to the cross for us. He still went to the cross for us. Two disciples betray Jesus. Yet one has gone down in history as a, the ultimate villain, while the other one went on to be, he went on to become a hero. And why? What, what they did next made all the difference. Matthew chapter 7, verse 3 to 5, records the next final days of Judas's life. When Judas, who, was be, who had betrayed Jesus, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. Oh, what is that to us? They replied. That's your responsibility. So Judas, Judas threw the money into the temple and left. And then he went away and hanged himself. Too late. Judas had changed his mind. Maybe he shed some tears, like Peter. And certainly he, he felt great guilt, because he says, you know, I've sinned for I've betrayed an innocent life. He regretted what he had done and the consequences of his choices. But that was it. We never see him ask for forgiveness or turn to God. He just felt remorse, and it sent him to his death. But Peter, on the other hand, oh, Peter, you know, the guy that just opens his mouth to change his feet, you know, jumps in with, all, with every hand and foot that he's got into situations. Peter, on the other hand, repented. He wept bitter tears for his sin. But he didn't just weep. He did more than that. You can tell that he repented from his sins because his life changed after that moment. That moment that he went out and he wept bitterly, from then on, his life was changed. He became bold and he became courageous for Christ. And after the crucifixion, what did he do? He joined the other disciples in, in prayer. He was the first disciple at the, at the empty tomb. And after Jesus' resurrection from the dead, Peter was reconciled to him and he received forgiveness from Jesus and also a commission. Just as Jesus had predicted. And in the Acts of the Apostles, Time and time again we read, Peter did this, or Peter said this, Peter went there. It was Peter, Peter, Peter. It's this changed man. This man who had once denied Christ had been restored, and he was now bold and courageous. A transformed man because of the forgiveness that Jesus had given to him. And so later on in his life, Peter could testify to the, the way that Jesus, Jesus, the way his death had secured forgiveness for people far from God. And he writes in 1 Peter 3 verse 18, For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. Amazing words from a man who had once denied Christ. And so we are left with two choices. We're left with two choices. You can give in to despair. You can stew in your guilt and let it eat you alive, just as, Jesus, as Judas did. Or you can repent, as Peter did. You can bring your sin before God for mercy and receive forgiveness that he offers to you. But only one of those two options leads to life. Only one of them leads to life. And it's only one that leads to life because of the one who loved the betrayer even as the betrayer betrayed him. When he looked at the denier even when the denier was denying him. And then he went to the cross to, to die the death of a guilty man. 
So stop and think about this. Just think about it for a moment. Jesus loved Judas and Peter enough to die for them. And he loves you just as much. Just as much. No matter how many times you stumble, no matter how many times you fall and weep and turn back to God, he still loves you. He takes your guilt and he makes it so that in God's sight, you're perfect. And I think that's the, sort, that's the kind of friend, the loyal friend that each of us needs. The, the one that will take us back no matter how many times we mess things up. Even though we don't deserve it. Jesus is that kind of friend that we have. And he's the friend that will never deny us. And he's never going to betray us. Paul writes those wonderful words in Romans chapter 8, verse 38 and 39, where he says that nothing, absolutely nothing, can separate us from the love of God. Isn't that wonderful? Nothing can separate us. Nothing in this world, nothing in the heavens can separate us from the love of God. And he will always give us the opportunity to turn back to him. And it's never too late. Never too late. And when we do turn back, well, the angels are rejoicing in heaven because a sinner has returned to the Father once again. So if you feel within your heart, maybe you've, you feel that you have failed Jesus, either by denying or betraying him, know that he died for you. That he forgives you. And that he accepts you back. He died for you. He forgives you. And he accepts you back again. So choose the choice and that path of life in him. Like Peter did. Heavenly Father, we've, we're struck once again at the, your grace that is so freely given. Father, who knows what would have happened if Judas in his realization of what he had done had sunk to his knees and asked for forgiveness. We don't know, Father. But we do know because of what Peter did, falling to his knees and weeping because of what he had done, and asking for forgiveness. And the way you reinstated him by forgiving him what he had done in his betrayal and his, his denial of you. Peter went on to do great things. So Father, before us this evening, we have a choice. We can either give in to, to, to that despair, we can stew in that guilt that we have, and we can let it eat us alive. Or we can come to you and say, Father, forgive me, like Peter did. And that in your mercy, we can receive forgiveness that you offer to us. just for a few moments in the silence think about the choices we have think about which road you're on which pathway you're walking down and if needs be make a decision tonight make a decision to be on the path of forgiveness the path of mercy the path of grace the path that leads to the Father, the path that leads to everlasting life. Because that is what God wants for you. Heavenly Father, you've heard the, the thoughts of our hearts. 
Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. And thank you for your love which is sown on the cross through your Son. That love that allowed your Son to die in our place so that we could turn and say, Father, forgive me for what I've done. Cleanse me by the blood of your Son. Wash me whiter than snow so that I can stand before you victorious in the knowledge and the hope of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit, fill us afresh. Fill us with your power. Fill us with your peace. Fill us with the grace of God so that we might not sin against him. And it's in the name of our, our Savior, our brother, and our friend we pray. Amen. So, go in God's grace. Go in His love. And in the knowledge that He loves you. That He loves you with an unending love. <laughs>